In 1992, Jim Carville said it's the economy, stupid. Well, it's the economy again. Let's take a look at Pennsylvania's next on Behind the Headlines. This is Behind the Headlines with behind the scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians. Sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to another edition of Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. And I'm joined by Maura Donnelly, uh, my co-host. Maura, welcome. Hello, Charlie. Well, we're progressing through the year, and yes. my goodness, it seems like uh, we're caught in the middle of the presidential season already. Doesn't it seem to be a bit premature, Maura? It does. It, there's a lot going on, that's for sure. Yeah, we, we get the presidential elections sooner and sooner <laughs> and sooner. We do. And, yet just and they like, want our money sooner and sooner and sooner. Oh, you're <laughs> right. You're right. And just like James Carville said a few years ago, the issue, again, seems to be it's the economy, stupid. Mm -hmm. Yes. And jobs. Yes, yeah, exactly. Definitely. Still exactly. jobs. And related to jobs, of course, is the importance of education and mm -hmm. higher education. And to talk about higher education in Pennsylvania, we're fortunate today to have with us one of the state's best experts on higher education, and that's Ken Nash, who's the vice president of ABSCUF. Ken, welcome to the show. It's Thanks. nice to have you back. You've Thanks. been here a little while ago. I was, been, I was here. It's good to be back, Charlie. Nice, nice to see you. It's nice to see you. Uh, we, of course, have gone through a spring uh, and early summer where we have talked on this show frequently about the governor's administration's early proposals for uh, how higher education was going to be treated in the budget and uh, some of the cuts that were called for were draconian to say the least the largest cuts that we've seen uh, or that were visualized uh, talked about anywhere in the country of fifty percent or more for higher education now that didn't come to pass when the budget finally was adopted what kind of cuts did higher education however uh, see in pennsylvania with uh... the governor's um, first budget Okay, well, for the 14 state schools that comprise the state system of higher education, as you said, originally it was proposed that there be a 50% cut, which was actually a little bit more because there was some stimulus money that we'd received. So our budget was going down something like 56% if that was going to take place. Mm -hmm. When all is said and done, though, we wound up with an 18% cut, uh, which is about $90 million. The thing is, though, you know, when we, uh, we've been over the years been taking cuts and cuts and cuts, and it's become increasingly difficult to do what we do well uh, with the kinds of monies that we're getting from the Commonwealth. Uh, but we do continue to do it well. Uh, we've, you know, we've cut back about all we possibly can. Uh, we're concerned as we enter into this year how we're going to be able to handle that 18% cut. Uh, we're concerned about what that means for the future, too. So you didn't necessarily have a sigh of relief that it was only 18 percent? Well, you know, it was a mixed blessing. We were very grateful to our friends, particularly in the legislature, who uh, fought to, to uh, reduce the amount that the governor had proposed. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we weren't dancing in the streets. Yeah. We weren't all very happy. And, of course, we're never happy when we wind up with a tuition increase. And we wound up with a 7.5 percent tuition increase. That's the largest tuition increase since 2002. And it, it hurts us because we as faculty, we, we want access. And every time tuition goes up, of course, it becomes more and more difficult for, you know, average people to be able to afford a college education. Now, being in a position that you're in, Ken, as the vice president of the faculty union that represents all the professors in the 14 state universities here in Pennsylvania, Millersville, Shippensburg, Edinburgh, uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and so forth, uh, you're in a very good place to be able to assess what will the effect of these cuts uh, that are um, that are being brought about by this budget, what will the effects be on the students? Uh, in the system, what will the effects be on uh, faculty members? All right, well, we have several universities which have already said that they're looking at can they retrench or lay off faculty members. So we're, we are, of course, concerned that. Isn't when that we unusual? Because the numbers are up, aren't they? Enrollment numbers are up. Why would you be laying off 
faculty members when enrollments are up. Well, that's seven and a half percent tuition increase didn't cover the gap uh, that remained from the 18 percent cut. So the universities are looking at ways to trim their budgets. Of course, we think that the last thing that should happen is that they should be cutting faculty because cutting faculty means cutting back on programs. It means ultimately hurting the quality of education at our schools. And we believe that our students, the students today, the students of tomorrow, deserve the same kind of quality education that you know the, everybody else has received when they've come to our universities. Well, we all have a lot of friends right now packing up their kids and heading off to, uh, to various colleges across the, the Commonwealth. What can the, uh, the average student expect upon arriving at the, at the university? Are they going to notice anything right away or are they going to just sort of slowly see the changes? Oh, I think that they'll see, s they may be on some campuses, depending on what the circumstances are at the individual campuses, there may be some things that are noticeable. For example, at my university, East Stroudsburg University, I know that class sizes are going up. So there'll be more students in every classroom uh, because they're not going to hire the same numbers of temporary faculties that they had. Uh, in previous years. Uh, in other campuses already we've seen from last year already, uh, for example at Kutztown University there was, uh, re there was retrenchment of faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, at Mansfield University there also was retrenchment of faculty and as part of that retrenchment there's been cutbacks in programs. So for example we've seen cutbacks in humanities at Mansfield. So you know again we believe that students deserve a, a broad education because it's that broad education that's going to prepare them for the future. Uh, and that's what our Commonwealth needs. Mm -hmm. well, Ken, there's an interesting, um, and you're in a good position to see this um, development as well throughout much of northern Pennsylvania and western Pennsylvania. Of course, we have the development of the Marcellus Shale industry. Um, you see a lot of this development. I've heard uh, and we've seen that uh, there are s some students that seem to be delaying um, admission to the university so they can work in the Marshallis shale industry for a little bit uh, longer. Uh, is that something that is a, is a true trend or what's, uh, what's up with, uh, with uh, those developments? Because I don't think we ever thought we'd be discussing Marcellus Shale <laughs> <laughs> and the state this, system, yeah. system at the yeah, same time. I never time. thought I'd be talking about Marcellus Shale <laughs> yeah, with so you please, or with Please Steve help Dicks. us. Yeah. Right. We are seeing a trend, at least they think they're seeing a trend up there in the northern tier of schools that some students may be looking for work uh, first and it also changes the role a little bit of what's expected from those universities uh, too as far as preparation goes. You know, what are they going to do to respond to the availability of Marcellus sh uh, Shale there. Now, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because the governor had sort of let it slip out at some point that perhaps some of our universities that are sitting on, mm -hmm. um, are, uh, you know, where the gas is, that perhaps that they would be, you know, be able to reap some of the benefit of the income there, which we can't do right now. We're not allowed to. It would go into the state coffers. Uh, but if there is an impact fee, ultimately, that there may be some benefit. Is that what you're saying? They haven't really put the impact fee in place, but you may be able to fund job programs. Is that what you're talking no, about? No, no, no. Yeah. The, the impact fees really go to the local communities right, to offset, right. you know, infrastructure problems yes. uh, that might occur there. There's been talk out there, really, that if if a university like you know Mansfield or Lock Haven is sitting on top of, oh, guess, sitting on top right, of now, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. They might be able to use those revenues yes. to, to, you know. To, Just to like any, the any uh, the average homeowner, right? The, yes, the average absolutely. Homeowner. As it okay. as it stands right now, uh, that money, if it was a brought, you know, if they did drill there, that money would go to the Commonwealth, right. To the general fund, not to our universities. But we don't we don't know that anything's going to happen uh, with that. Okay. Well, the interesting thing is, in a t traditional wisdom says that in times of economic distress, that the importance of education goes up, that we need to retrain part of our workforce, um, that we need to prepare for the future, and that is the job of uh, education and higher education in particular. Um, yet here we're seeing uh, cuts to higher education when we're entering some of the worst economic times we've known in Pennsylvania since the Great Depression. What do you think the role of higher education should be, Ken, uh, now and in the future? Well, you know, it's, it's a great question because we do see more and more 
uh, people suggesting that our university should be more involved with job training or you know do very specific things to help people get jobs. We're convinced, however, that the best way to prepare people for the future is to make sure that they have a well-rounded education. Mm -hmm. That we don't know what the jobs of tomorrow will necessarily be. So what we need to do is to prepare our students so that they're, you know, they take classes in the humanities and economics and all the other subjects that are available to them so that they are flexible and they can mm -hmm. move from job to job. And on top of that, we want to make sure that, you know, not, we want to make sure that there are not just jobs in Pennsylvania. We want to make sure that there are quality jobs in Pennsylvania. And we want to make sure that we have a quality workforce. So we want, you know, high end, as much as possible to create high-end jobs here. Uh, we're in a bad spot here because uh, I, th I think an organization called Complete College America said that about, estimates about 57% of Pennsylvanians will need at least some post-secondary education. And right now we are 46 out of 50 states as far as students with a college degree. That just seems unwise. You know, we've we, been mired there for many, many, many years in that lower, lower bracket. We really are. And, you know, if we really want to create those good jobs, if we want to really make sure that our future is a bright one and that we're doing the best that we possibly can, we need to invest. This is what college, uh, you know, the college education is about. It's about for the individual student who's going to get uh, the education to try and prepare them for a lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, both you know, a lifetime you know, in an occupation, but also a lifetime as a citizen in the Commonwealth. But that investment doesn't just pay off for the individual student. That investment pays off for the entire Commonwealth. What you wind up with are students who are getting better jobs, who pay more tax money because they have a better job. You're winding up with good businesses moving into the area. So it's not just a benefit for the individual person getting it, it's a benefit that we all enjoy when we have a well-educated populace. So, you know, we just don't think it's wise policy, but that's, you know, the trend seems to be to uh, defund higher education mm -hmm. and put more the burden on the individual to pay for it, even though it's a collective benefit. You know, I think a lot of businesses would agree with you. They would rather get the well-rounded uh, adult who's ready to work, and they would train them in the specifics of their industry or their, their position. So I think, it, you know, it, it's very smart to be sticking to keeping the well-rounded education. And whenever you see an interview with the CEO of a major corporation, mm -hmm. The, and you, they talk about what kind of employee they want to have. Time and time again, what they say is, we want that student who has the, you know, the broad background. Mm -hmm. We want the student the ability to learn, right? Yeah. Who's flexible, uh, who has, uh, you know, the ability to work well with other people. Mm -hmm. The very kinds of things that come along with a quality college education. Someone who reads well, who writes well, who speaks well, right. and has a broad knowledge of a variety of fields. I can think critically too, sure. and that's really what what is college all about. It's about really being in, you know, those situations where you're challenged. And you're challenged to think, and you're challenged to think in different ways than you may ordinarily be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you may not change your perspective, but at least you have resources on which to rely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ten seconds. How are contract negotiations going? Can you talk about that? Well, I could tell you this. They're, they're ongoing, and, and we're hopeful that we'll uh, have them done soon. Okay. So that that will be taken care of between the Commonwealth and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the Union. Okay, very good. It's been wonderful having you here again. We look forward to having you back soon, Ken, and we'll be back with a second segment right after this. Stay tuned. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions that make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. By the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Express, transporting construction, farm, and industrial equipment throughout the United States.
and by Penn Waste, your best local choice for your waste removal and recycling needs. Hi, welcome back to the second segment of Behind the Headlines. On this segment, uh, Mar and I will be continuing our examination of Pennsylvania's economy and jobs, and we were talking about the, uh, the situation where it's the economy stupid, as Jim Carville would have us uh, believe, and uh, for that examination, we're joined by Dave Patty. Dave, welcome. Thanks. Thank Dave, of back. course, is the president and CEO of the Pennsylvania Business Council and has been uh, a guest with us before and is one of the most knowledgeable people in Pennsylvania on the state of Pennsylvania's economy and jobs. Um, Dave, a couple um, weeks ago, a month ago, uh, I thought to, that you had put together a very excellent list to sort of give us um, an idea of where the Corbett administration is, what the accomplishments of the Corbett administration have been thus far. Could you uh, give us a, a recap of that, sort of, so allow people to see your idea of where the Corbett administration sure. and, and, is? And I think, you know, not only the Corbett administration, but, but the General Assembly as well. Uh, there had been, uh, I think we were referencing as, as, as I had been thinking about how there's some criticism through the spring that they're not accomplishing anything. All this talk of, wow, what happens now? You know, we, we had Republicans in the House, the Senate, and, and, and the Governor's uh, mansion. And I think by the end of the budget cycle, uh, at the end of June, when, when, they, when they broke, actually there were a fair number of accomplishments that, that they all worked on together. But certainly the, the Governor's leadership on the budget, delivering an on-time budget that uh, did not increase any taxes, that yes, it made some cuts, but uh, I think all things considered, uh, we saw far less uh, a budgetary strife than we saw in other states. Uh, at the same time, he delivered a, uh, uh, a new contract with the labor unions, you know, a little criticism from, from people that may have been overly generous, but again, we didn't have the strife that other states have. I think that's a, a very good thing for the Commonwealth. Nothing like Wisconsin. Uh, right, yeah. right, uh, or even New Jersey for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, we were also able to do some things on, on education reform, didn't get vouchers quite across the line, but it's teed up for the fall. Uh, unemployment compensation, we took some, some steps there to reduce the cost and to get on the path to solvency of the unemployment compensation fund. Uh, we, we, we had the, the Transportation Commission working that, that now we're ready to look at some legislation. So I think there are a number of accomplishments that really are worth uh, noting that, that it was done quietly uh, without a lot of fanfare in some cases, but, but it's a good thing to have a state that's, that's running in a very stable, very uh, smooth path compared to what we see in some of the other places around the country. Well, we're heading into our fall legislative session soon, and so there's work left to be done. What do you see as some of the major issues facing both the governor and the General Assembly sure. this fall? Well, I, I think the governor's made it very clear that his <laughs> top priority is uh, to try and get the educational uh, bill through. So, so vouchers, mm -hmm. along with an, a uh, uh, education improvement tax credit program, put those two together. That's very much on the uh, table for the Senate Republicans as well. I think I think they and the governor share that as a top priority. Uh, for Representative Terzai and other members of the Republican caucus in the House, I, I think that they're, they're interested in those concepts and they believe in education, particularly the EITC portion of that, uh, but they'll consider vouchers and work with that. They'd also like to see uh, some, some movement on their legislation to sell the state liquor stores, mm -hmm. to divest those. I think both the uh, and ends of the building, and certainly the governor know that we need to do something about uh, the funding for transportation. Uh, so we'll be looking at that. There's of course a lot of pressure now that the Marcella Shale Commission has finished its work to look at an impact fee, and 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 uh, and, and possibly consider that kind of legislation this year. And then certainly in the fall, we'll, we'll have to take up the uh, congressional uh, reapportionment and, and the redistricting. We go from 19 to 18 congressional districts in Pennsylvania, and those lines need to be drawn before the election process. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a big issue. That's, that, yeah. that's big. A lot of work. But, and, and that, can be, that will be partisan. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, James Carville told um, uh, Bill Clinton as a candidate uh, for the presidency, it's the economy, stupid. Um, where are the jobs in Pennsylvania right now, Dave? Uh, we hear nationwide of the bank sitting on a trillion dollars, not loaning it, actually hoarding it. Um, where are the jobs in the nation? Where are the jobs in Pennsylvania? What's the job outlook? Yeah, even, even more than James Carville, I think of uh, Clara Peller and, and where's the beef? Um, <laughs> yes. and, and, and I think um, it is the question from everybody. I mean, there's a lot of money sitting on the books of, of, of corporations. And mm -hmm. if there's one word that sums up the problem, it's uncertainty. Are we going to have federal health reform, the, the Obamacare or not? 
Are we going to have corporate tax relief that the Obama administration has talked about or not? What's that going to do for S corporations and, uh, and LLCs? Um, you know, where are we going with our foreign policy? Where are we going with trade policy? Are we going to adopt those trade agreements with Korea and Colombia and Panama or not? There are so many things that Washington's been, been, been talking about that, well, we can go this way, we can go this way. Do you wait till the next election to make a decision? Money's sitting on the sideline because money wants to know what's going to happen once, <laughs> once it gets there. And, and the uncertainty is, is certainly one of the killers. I, I think it's also why we're not seeing new businesses start. Uh, business startups in America overall, and Pennsylvania particularly, are, are, are way down from historic norms. P Pennsylvania is trailing the country. In a lot of ways, our economy is better than, than other areas mm -hmm. of, the, of the country. But in terms of new business formation, uh, we, we're, we're trailing the nation. And part of that, I think, is, is this degree of uncertainty. You know, we have 7.8% uh, unemployment. It's r dramatically lower than the, than the national right. average. But we've been going up the last couple of months, which is causing a The last two of months, we, we had slight upticks, yes. as did about half the states. Um, and in fact, uh, June and July numbers nationally were pretty much the same, that about half the states went up and about half the states held on and only you know, the small residual you know, actually went down a little bit. And those were the, were the worst cases mm -hmm. uh, prior. Um, you know, part of that is, is you know, add to that the international turmoil, you know, now, now uh, Libya, you know, yes. added to, to everything yeah. else that we saw this year. Um, but Pennsylvania's job situation overall um, it, it is, is ho it, it's, it's hanging in there, and, and manufacturing continues to, to lead the way in, in Pennsylvania. I mean, I think that's one of the stories that, that that's uh, a great story that needs to be told, is that our manufacturers have continued to increase the number of orders and therefore increase the, the number of jobs. Now, it is also true that in this last downturn, in this recession, companies have learned to be more productive, which means doing the same amount of work or even more with fewer people. Mm -hmm. And, and greater technology in some cases. Greater uses of technology, yes. uh, streamlining processes. Right. Um, and I think the thing that is, is particularly difficult for people to understand is that we have eliminated a level of management. And in fact, I, you know, it's, it's not the, the, the laborers and, and particularly skilled labor that, that's lost its jobs in, in this recession, but it is you know, the 45, 50, 55 year old, white collar, people with college degree, advanced degrees that were cut out uh, of the middle, and, and that's what made the companies leaner and more productive. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, the, there is hiring taking place for skilled labor. There's still a, you know, there are jobs going unfilled even in this economy because we, we, we're having a hard time matching the skills that we need to the jobs mm -hmm. that are open. But, uh, but there are a number of industrial uh, uh, positions that are open. I was meeting last week with people from workforce investment boards around the state, and, and they're hearing that from their employers. And, and the key is listen to your employers, and let's get the training in place to get the right skills. Right. Uh, and, and that might be taking somebody with a master's degree and retraining them in, in, into something that's more hand-oriented than head-oriented, mm -hmm. but, but uh, you know, those jobs are out there. Mm -hmm. I think you are a better patron, a more um, uh, committed patron than I am to Starbucks. I'm a big fan, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I don't drink too much coffee, but uh, I understand that the, the uh, CEO of mm -hmm. Starbucks um, Howard Schultz has called on other corporate executives mm -hmm. not to invest with politicians and until politicians get their act together that um, businesses should sit out and uh, reconsider investing in the political process altogether. What do you, have you heard about that, David? I what do you this, think about This was that? just been making news at the end of last week. Um, and, and, and I understand that what he's reacting to is the same frustration that everybody else has. And, 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 and to his credit, this is not somebody who uh, was born to wealth and, 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 and privilege. He worked his way up from the bottom, you know, grew up in, in Brooklyn, uh, you know, son of, of, of a World War II uh, veteran, and, and, and he, everything he has he made on his own, uh, working for Xerox and a number of different companies. And, and so I think he reflects that, that cross-section of America that's just frustrated with Washington. Now, I, having said that I, I validate that, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with his prescription. Um, I don't think we need less political action. I think we need more political action. And certainly from, from the business community's point of view, I'm, I'm calling for them to be more active, more aggressive. Now, that might mean uh, withholding contributions from the people you see as part of the problem. But if anything, I would say double your contributions to the people who you, you see as part of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and for the business community, the, the solution normally is in the middle. It's not extremist of either party. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it, is, it is the people, who, and, and that's why you, you hear about the people who, who will seek compromise and accommodation and, and, um, and a middle ground and balance uh, the, the winners and the losers to try and, and, and get to yes in, in DC. And so, you know, I, I, th I think he's, he's um, right to say, let's reconsider where we make our political contributions, but, uh, but that means let's not just stop. You know, a, a blanket uh, unilateral dis disarmament is not gonna help anybody. Let's be strategic about it. And let's get those people elected next year who are gonna go down to work with one another and score points. Well, that's, he runs an interesting company that's had to face some difficult times through the, throughout this economy. I mean, they've, you know, there used to be a Starbucks on every corner in right. New York City. There, you got to walk a few blocks now before you <laughs> before you <laughs> right. find them. Such right. a hardship. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, you know, they've really had to make some difficult decisions too. And and he's not a CEO that's been typically politically involved that I'm that I'm aware of. Right. No, so he, it's he was not a heavy in. hitter. No. You know, frankly, I mean, he gave maybe I don't know, ten, fifteen grand a year. Yeah. Uh, predominantly, uh, almost exclusively, to, to Democrats from from the Northwest U.S. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe he was just given to the wrong candidates, you know. I, I, uh, yeah. But um, I'm sure he's looking at that now. <laughs> um, the, but but he did engender a conversation among others in the business community, and, and, and now, of course, in, in in the media and as w as well, and, and among all of the, the chattering classes like us, you know, to to say, is this right? And 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 where does all of this money go, and, and how is it used? Is it you know? It has to be more than just that, that we like this person, mm -hmm. they're our friend, but, but well, what, is what kind of public the, what policy is the they answer? Uh, what, what is the answer to get Washington working? Yes. Well, and I, and I would differentiate Washington and Harrisburg. I think Harrisburg, I mean, the way we started this segment, I think Harrisburg worked fairly effectively this year. Now, um, that doesn't mean that everybody got what they wanted. And certainly I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are Democrats who, who'd say, well, you know, it would have been better policy had we been more in the mix and we didn't have much say, we were kind of shut out of the process. Um, but but what we don't see in Washington are decisions, and, and I think you know what we're lacking is, is is decisive leadership, whether it be from the president, from members of Congress. Uh, you know, the decision doesn't even have to be a good one. Just make a decision. <laughs> do let, something. You know, do something, yes. and people can follow it. And and uh, when it comes to public policy, very seldom is there only one way to do it. You know, there are, there are multiple ways to create jobs, and and they might both be right. We might philosophically like one method better than the other, mm -hmm. more government or less government. Um, but ultimately, leadership's de defined by followership, and right now there's no one to follow uh, because no one's no one's leading. I, yeah. You know, I, I think of, of of the great people we think of as great presidents in, in recent memory of, of an FDR, or Truman, uh, you know, a JFK, a Ronald Reagan. They all made tons of bad decisions as well as yeah. good ones, but but they were leaders. Well, and decisions <laughs> yeah. would lead to certainty, and certainty would lead to business loosening its purse right. strings. Right, right. Even, and jobs. even if it's a bad decision, so there we, we, we can react to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We can plan for bad policy. And that's a good note to uh, to wrap up with. Uh, we thank you very much for being with us, talking about where the jobs are, and we'll continue to look for them. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, we hope that uh, you'll find one if you don't have one already. Uh, and uh, we hope that you'll continue to tune us in. We'll see you next week um, right back here on Behind the Headlines. <laughs> <laughs>